and it is and you're you're good to go awesome welcome everybody all right so we are just waiting for our attendees to start joining us we have a few coming in brad hey brad nice to see you brad griffiths robert seeley greg rapp tom pular boy they're piling in so we're going to have a great meeting today to find out some new and exciting things that are happening right here in the Lehigh Valley with the Eastern Area Joint Sewer Authority. We have an amazing team of people to share with you today. Tom McMonagle, blast from the past. Nice to see Tom McMonagle. All right, looks like we're going to have a big group. Dan Fortech joining us today. So for our panel today, how are you guys feeling? You feeling pretty good? Happy it's, pretty ready. Happy it's Friday. <laughs> We're, we saw Carrie's little moonshine glass. She's hiding it now. It's it's moonshine Friday at the EAJSA. Just letting everybody know it's the place to be. See, look, she's ready to roll. <laughs> Keeping hydrated. Keeping hydrated. Keeping hydrated. So great. Great. What are you actually drinking? Iced tea. <laughs> Which also suits the mason jar situation. It does. It does. <laughs> it does suit the mason jar situation for sure. All right. Got a little note from Tom McMonagle. We go way back. We sure do. <laughs> I love seeing all these names. Bob Lammy. There he is. Andy Schnecks joining us. Great. Great to see all of you. Excellent. We're going to kick things off here promptly at 11 o'clock. Give everybody a chance to join in for our amazing roundtable with the um, extraordinary crew at the EAJSA. We'll include Jeff Morgan in on that extraordinary crew, too. Just saying. Look at him. Jeff Morgan, are you deep at work right now? What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? You're on mute. All these people are here to, to look at you and, and tap into your knowledge and expertise. It's going to be an amazing day. Well, I have to be on mute because I have background noise in, in, in my office here. There's what? echoing from upstairs. Yeah. Wait, what yeah. kind of background noise could you possibly have <laughs> in that quiet house office? It might be the, the dog. I'm not sure. It's just something I, in the background. Huh. I'm not sure what it is. Huh. I'm not so sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go back on mute for now. What is that thing in the background there? What is that little white thing? Is that like how you feel today? That little white stuffed animal thing on your bookshelf? No comment. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Hey, Sharon. And we have Joe Morrow. Uh, Janet is with us. Wow. We got a great crew today. Glad everybody can join us. We got two minutes. Um, so as we get things kicked off, I just to let everybody know how um, how candid these roundtables are. I'm just going to ask Carrie. I'm going to put yes. you on the hot seat. Hi. How much time did you practice today for this roundtable? Um, I practiced with Alex. I called my husband and video chatted with him, and I ran it by my assistant. But as far as preparation for the roundtable. Not much. Was it simple? Was it easy? You know, it's my first round table. So I spent a little bit more time preparing than what I normally would for a presentation or a training or what have you. Um, but it wasn't too much. No, it's Great. more talking about our knowledge about the project and what we're hoping to get out of it. Excellent. Excellent. Just keeping it easy, keeping it simple, sharing your experiences. Chuck, he's like beside himself to be here today. Can you tell? <laughs> he's over the top i mean this is 60 minutes of pure excitement what better way to, to to be in the middle of your friday for real i mean seriously you guys i know you've been looking forward to this all week 100 percent. we've been planning I, this for weeks to get it going bam 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 well we're at that 11 o'clock mark so i'm going to share my screen with everybody first i want to welcome everybody to the picks um round table the sneak peek of what's happening 
at the EAJSA. I'm going to bring up my screen here. Can everybody see my screen from the panel? If you guys can see it, I'm sure everybody else can. Yeah. I can All see right. your panel. Great, great, great. So um, again, today we are just talking about um, what's happening at the EAJSA. Great things happening in the Lehigh Valley from um, from an environmental standpoint. So for the attendees today, I just wanted to do a quick overview. My name is Tori Morgan. I will be your moderator for today. I am the president of the PICS um, organization. We have a lot of our PICS members on the, um, on the call today. Thanks for being here today. And two of them, Alex and Jeff, also um, involved with PICS. Thank you. So today we're going to have 60 minutes of pure excitement. Put on your seatbelts, get ready. Um, I'm going to do a quick Picks introduction, um, a word from our sponsor, who's Hazen and Sawyer. Thrilled to have them here today. Um, I'm going to introduce our panel, then we're going to go right into our presentation. Um, what I do ask is during our presentation, so that we can get through the entire presentation for all of the um, panelists today, is as you have questions as we go through, please just put your questions in the Q&A. You can put as many questions in as you want, and then when the presentations are over, I'll go back through and and have all your questions answered for you. So make sure you just put those questions in that Q&A. Um, at the end of the session, um, I will bring up a slide to show everybody's email addresses in case you ever need to reach out to anybody here on the panel. And we will have, when you sign off, a short survey um, for all of you to fill out. I promise it is simple and easy and really will help us here at PIX to um, better serve all of you and create presentations that are usable and and make sense for your organization. So without further ado, I ask one simple request. Put away your cell phones, sit back, relax, enjoy. It's an hour of nothing else to think about, but these amazing people that are on this panel today. And at the end of all of this, um, we will have a recording of today's presentation, along with a short recording um, from our sponsor, Hazen and Sawyer, to share a little bit more about them. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, oops, I didn't mean to do that. I apologize. Um, I'm going to stop share. And first, I'm just going to tell you all a little bit about PICS. PICS is, um, was started back in 1990. If you guys aren't familiar with PICS, um, we're a 501c3 organization that was primarily started by IPP coordinators from Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton, and Caddy. Um, we received our, our start money from EPA. And with that start money, what we um, our mission is to do is create networking and educational um, resources to industries um, and people alike in the Lehigh Valley to help with pretreatment related um, questions, challenges, issues. It's really to create a network of information. And that's what we're doing today by providing this roundtable to all of you. So that's a little bit about PICS. If you'd like to learn more and learn more about our members, all you need to do is go to www.lvpix.org, learn all about PICS and find out a little bit more about all of our um, board members and members. So without further ado, what I would like to do is first of all, thank Hazen and Sawyer for sponsoring today's event and making this all possible. And today we have Micah Blate with us, who is representing Hazen and Sawyer. Micah is an associate located out of the Hazen and Sawyer Philadelphia office. He's a licensed PE with 10 years of experience focused in biosolids and wastewater process. Micah, I'd like to just give you you the floor for a couple of minutes to share a little bit about Hazen and Sawyer. Okay, thank you, Tori, and thanks for having me today. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to tell you guys a little bit about Hazen and Sawyer. So, Hazen and Sawyer, we're a top ENR firm. We've been around since uh, 1951. Um, actually, our founder um, was the son of Alan Hazen, who developed the Hazen and Williams coefficient. Uh, in hydraulics, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. So we have about 1,500 staff. We're all engineers. We're an uh, employee-owned organization, not run by business people. We're run by engineers, uh, which we're very happy to say. 
We do all things water and wastewater. So we focus in stormwater, water resources, conveyance, uh, drinking water, CSO, uh, water reuse, wastewater, environmental planning, biosolids, um, and energy management. We have offices across the US. Uh, we've worked on some of the largest um, plants in the world. Uh, we have a, we designed the Croton UV facility um, in New York City, um, which is the largest in the world, um, all the way down to the smallest plants uh, in the world. So very uh, proud to be part of the Hazen and Sawyer organization um, and happy to su support the PICS. Uh, this is my first time here, so thanks for having me, appreciate it. If you have any questions about Hazen and Sawyer, uh, please reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you, Micah. We appreciate you being here today and appreciate you being a sponsor for our PICS event. Much much it much to learn about Hazen and Sawyer. Thank you. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our panel for today. And first I'm gonna start with Mr. Chuck Wilson. Raise your hand up there, Chuck. Everybody Morning, know who everybody. you <laughs> Chuck is the City of Easton Wastewater Treatment Plant Operations Manager. Chuck graduated from Montana State University Northern with a Bachelor of Science in Business with a minor in water quality. He has operated water and wastewater facilities in the Yellowstone National Park and was the superintendent of the Ed Thomas Water Plant in Burlington, North Carolina, before coming northeast to become superintendent of the City of Easton Water Plant. Chuck, thanks for being here today. Thank it's a you pleasure. For Absolutely. Carrie. Raise your hand. There she is. Carrie, welcome. Carrie is the City of Easton Wastewater Treatment Plant Laboratory Manager. Carrie gained accreditation through the DEP um, in three months. That's incredible. Great job, Carrie. She previously worked as a laboratory analyst um, for suburban testing labs before becoming a traveling wastewater operator, a gypsy. A, extraordinaire. <laughs> so she is a graduate of Kutztown University with a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry. Thank you, Carrie, for joining us today. Thank you. All right, next, Alex Hoffman. Extraordinaire she is. She is the City of Easton Wastewater Treatment Plant Assistant operations manager and IPP coordinator. Alex started her wastewater career in 2013 as a laboratory analyst at the city on sites laboratory and she's transitioned into the IPP manager role in 2016. She has since been promoted to her dual role as assistant operations manager and IPP manager together. Alex is a certified wastewater operator and obtained her BS degree in environmental science from Bloomsburg University. Thanks for being here, Alex. Thanks for having me. You got it. Okay, last <laughs> but not least, look at the smiles coming on. Jeff Morgan, PE, SC Engineers, and also the um, Consulting Engineer for the Eastern Area Joint Sewer Authority. Jeff has over 30 years of diverse engineering construction and client management experience. He is familiar with all aspects of the MPDES system and program and has served as an expert witness in MPDES permit appeals and cases and otherwise assures that municipalities and authorities comply with all of their wastewater, stormwater and regulatory requirements. A fun fact about Jeff Morgan, he's still on mute so I can say this, is rumor has it he also has the most extraordinary wife ever. Just saying, just saying. Anyways, anything you'd like to add to that, Jeff Morgan? I, I think I covered you. All good. I will take the Fifth Amendment on the uh, last comment. Right okay. there. <laughs> it's probably wise. <laughs> probably wise. So we have an amazing panel lined up for all of you today. And again, um, this is an opportunity to share some of the most amazing things going on at the EAJSA that are going to help um, the environment, the business, the residents. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the screen over to Alex, who will start the presentation. I would just like to remind the audience again, if you have questions as they go through their presentations, please make sure and put them in the Q&A. And then when all of the presentations are over, we'll make sure to answer all of your questions and have an open dialogue on them. So without further ado, Alex, it's all you. Thank you, Tori. 
Go ahead, Chuck, you're up. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, as Tori said, my name is Chuck Wilson. I'm the operations manager here at the uh, City of Easton Wastewater Plant. Uh, the City of Easton works together and is a board member of the Easton Area Joint Sewer Authority. Uh, the city runs the day-to-day -day operations. The authority, which has six members and 11 municipalities, uh, handle all of the uh, capital improvement projects. And as Tori mentioned, Jeff Morgan is the consulting engineer. Uh, the plant itself uh, was built in 1953. Uh, it started out as a trickling filter plant. Uh, there was a RBCs installed at one time. Uh, currently, we have an oxidation ditch that we uh, run in series. Our flows 10 million gallons a day were permitted for. We average about five and a half. Uh, we have 80,000 residents approximately and 36 permitted industries. Uh, our effluent uh, is Typically good, our daily solids are about eight, and the uh, CBOD is four, and our ammonias are 0.2. So we re usually receive, uh, achieve full nitrification in our oxidation ditch. There's a, we have a staff of 21. So uh, today's presentation, I'm gonna focus on a screenings upgrade. Uh, so we have a, a couple sets of rotomats, but, uh, we looked at uh, screenings upgrades because of the uh, industry-wide increase in disposable wipes, uh, flushable wipes. Uh, they've been causing a lot of issues uh, at our plant and many other plants uh, with uh, blocking our primary clarifier sludge lines and our primary sludge pumps, uh, which we have uh, two Volsangs, rotary lobes, and we've just a lot of maintenance related to rags. So currently uh, we have a couple of Lakewood Rotomats, which were installed in 1998 and we rehab them in 2010. So they're about 30% efficient. Uh, there's about quarter inch spacing between them. And just because of the age, the spacing itself has gotten bent up uh, just from the use. And uh, so we, we went out, we looked at a couple sites and attended a couple seminars and decided it was time for a screenings upgrade. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are the lakeside rotomats, uh, you know, with the 45 degree angle and the screw and the, uh, the bar screens are the screens, the bars sit in uh, the chamber with a rotating arm to clean them. And uh, right now they go into a, uh, just a bin and everything goes to the landfill uh, along with our sludge. Uh, about two years ago, we installed a manual bar screen to help with it, a uh, half inch spaced manual bar screen, which has alleviated some of the problems, but we still have a lot of rags. Next slide, please. So we went with a, uh, we looked at and decided upon a Hydrodyne Great White Shark Center Flow Unit which uh, is going to have a two millimeter spacing, 90% efficiency rate, and uh, the units are fully enclosed, so we don't have to spray uh, from it. Um, and they're going to be retrofitted into our existing unit. And here's a little GIF of how they work. So the material goes in the center. It's caught in the sides and deposited out the top. And directly after this, we'll talk about, we got a compactor uh, and we'll go into the existing, we're gonna use our existing bins and then again, go to the landfill. So uh, next slide, please. So we got a white tip shark, again, hydrodyne compactor. And this is not the white tip we purchased. Uh, you know, PowerPoint, PowerPoint makes all these suggestions, so I just threw it in there. Uh, so with the compactor, uh, we get a weight reduction of up to 80%, uh, a screenings volume reduction of up to 85%, organic removal up to 95%, and then uh, the dewater uh, content reduction, I think it's up to 40%, which again equates to money uh, that you're sending, saving by not sending, uh, you know, uh, water-laden material to the landfill. 
And uh, that's about it on my end. Oh, sorry. Uh, and the compactor is going to go on top of the, uh, the screening. And we'll go into, uh, we'll look similar to the first picture to all the way to your left on the screen. Uh, except instead of a bag, we'll have the current uh, dumpsters that we use. And then the best part about wastewater is slides all the way to the right where you see what the material actually looks like after it's processed. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Hi everybody. My name is Alex Hoffman. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the disc filter along with Carrie Lambert. So on this slide, you are viewing the future site of the new disc filter building and system. EHASA is installing a disc filter system to prevent the solids from being washed out from the secondary clarifiers during upsets. These upset situations cause the sludge blankets to become fluidized and can cause washouts, discharging them directly to the contact tank. These conditions usually occur under like heavy storm events or rain events. These situations have caused historical violations for us in the plant in the past. And uh, when these washouts occur, it, um, one day of high solids can make it very, very hard for us to meet our weekly average for total suspended solids, which I will be referring to as TSS later on. This was initially what drove the interest in the project, but there are many benefits other than preventing upsets that we will be discussing later on. We have been consistently achieving effluent TSS results of less than 10 milligrams per liter, knock on wood, <laughs> which will make the disc filter more of a polishing system. But during upset events, it will become very much a valuable compliance asset. This project will consist of uh, new disc filters, new backwash reject water pumps, a wet well manhole, a new building to house the major components, new piping to dispose of the reject water, piping modifications to the existing gravity effluent lines, and electrical and control work. The basis of the design for this project was based on an average flow of 5 million gallons per day. The design flow of the plan of 10 million gallons per day, a peak flow rate of 25 million gallons per day, and an average influent total suspended solids of 10 milligrams per liter, and a max influent TSS of 130 milligrams per liter. In this photo, you can see the new reject water pump station, which is the round one there, and the valve vault, which is the rectangular one. This is the current status of the construction project, and the project is scheduled to be completed, I would say, by the end of this year, beginning of next year. This project includes the installation of two tertiary disc filter units. Each disc filter unit is designed to handle the plant's average daily flow of up to 10 million gallons per day. The filters were designed to operate in parallel during the average daily flow to reduce wear and tear of these units. When the total plant flow exceeds the average daily flow or permanent design flow, the filters will continue to operate in parallel and are designed to each handle a peak daily flow of 12.5 MGD for a total daily flow of 25 MGD. So the two units together will handle our peak flow. Each filter contains an overflow pipe to a common trough to ensure the unit does not flood or back up the gravity flow from the secondary clarifiers. Reject water containing the backwash from the solids from the filters will be sent by gravity to a new wet well manhole and periodically pumped to the existing secondary sludge wet well. I'm gonna pass it on to Carrie to talk about our filtration. So I'm gonna start talking about the disc filter in itself and some of the things that, some of the things that are gonna be bonuses about having it installed for our plant. Um, so first off, design. So there's gonna be two, sets of filters working together. Each piece of that pie is one round disc with triangular sections in it. It's 100% stainless steel. Each disc itself has a pore size of 10 micrometers. As it's flowing and working together, it will prevent uh, particles up 
down to five micrometers from passing through with its unique dynamic tangineal filtration system. Um, a really unique aspect about this filter in and of itself is the fact that on the discs, there are pie-like sections that can be removed by themselves. And this will make maintenance on the equipment much more efficient, much easier. And we're not gonna have to take the disc filter out of service in order to do maintenance on it. So in 2018, we had our initial pilot project looking at different disc filters to put in place. Um, we suggest that if you're looking at a big piece of equipment or something like that, to definitely ask about doing a pilot project and having one of those run to test it, to see if um, your parameters, what you're looking to achieve can happen with your piece of equipment. Um, we had a pilot project and we're impressed with the amount of solids removal that we were able to achieve. That is our main goal of putting this piece of equipment in place. Um, during the pilot project, we had very specific parameters that we were looking at, and we had an organized testing plan as well to ensure that we were getting quality data and proof of concept. We were able to remove a 116 TSS or total solids, total suspended solids down under the reporting limit of either 0.2 of either two or one. Our average TSS, as was mentioned before, is under 10. So having this equipment running all the time is gonna allow us to achieve a final effluent with a below the reporting limit on a day-to-day -day basis. Flip the slide. So how the flow of this goes is the influent enters the inlet chamber while the filtering discs are stationary. The filtering disc will start the rotation as the flow rate increases. When the inlet chamber reaches a certain level, it triggers the backwash system and the filter water drains at a consistent flow rate, flow rate into the collecting duct between the filtering discs. The solids settled between the filtering discs are then discharged by a pipe with a motorized valve and the backwash water is then recycled for retreatment. The solids settled between the, the disc filter um, also is gonna work to protect our microbial population in the event of a severe weather condition um, and by preventing a washout and possible violations from this. It also works by decreasing the amount of total solids coming out into our chlorine contact tank. Um, this decreases the amount of chemical usage and maintenance costs. We're gonna see this create, hopefully, a more stable and predictable chemical usage across the board um, since the final effluent quality is gonna be much better. And we're also gonna, it's gonna be more consistent. Um, it's going to prevent overchlorination during rain events and high flows, and it's going to decrease the amount of algal growth that we see in our chlorine contact tank by decreasing the food supply to them, meaning less maintenance required on our chlorine contact tank. Since we're going to be creating a much higher quality final effluent, we're going to be able to use our effluent as seal water and use it for tracer utility water purposes. This is gonna significantly decrease our utility bills or water bills across the board. Um, we're gonna see this lead back into cost savings for the authority and for our industries due to the decrease in cost for operations of the plant. The decrease in cost for operations will be reflected in the cost of surcharge fees for our industries. And you know, overall, we're looking forward to seeing this piece of equipment and what it can do for us and we're looking forward to seeing um, a higher quality final effluent for us. Jeff? Okay, thank you. Um, before I forget, since that happens very easily, um, I just wanted to add a couple things to the, to the bar screen and the disc filter projects. You guys, you guys did a fantastic job um 
just some uh, financial information. Um, so the, the disk filter project, um, back in 2014, the authority paid off a number uh, or a, a set of old bonds. And when that uh, payoff occurred, they refinanced uh, some existing debt and did a new bond issue and were able to uh, uh, obtain a bunch of construction funds for a bunch of other projects without increasing the debt service to all the municipalities. Um, we bulk bill all the municipalities and then the municipalities individually bill uh, all, the, all the customers. The, um, the authority only directly bills the uh, permitted industries for surcharge and IPP costs. So as part of that project, uh, uh, part of that bond issue, a number of projects came in under budget and we had some extra money left. And so we went ahead with the, um, the disc filter project. Um, the cost of that project is roughly about $3 million. Um, and then moving forward on the um, um, screening upgrade project, uh, the authority just recently went out with interest rates being so low for a new bond issue uh, for some of these projects, uh, some other projects that we're gonna be doing in the future, including uh, this fog and uh, combined heat and power project, as well as the uh, upgrade to the mechanical bar screens. Uh, the mechanical bar screen project is estimated at about $900,000. We actually received bids this morning I have not seen them yet uh, or looked at them closely yet, but they have come in under budget, uh, which is a good thing. So that project will be uh, moving forward. And so I um, figured I'd try and uh, field or a few questions now, because I'm sure everybody wants to know what all of this stuff costs. So I figured I'd uh, share some of that info before I move on to this project. So we have worked on this uh, fog receiving combined heat and power digester mix, mixing project for a long time. Um, next slide, please. So we started in uh, November of 2016 with the uh, biogas utilization study. And we looked at a variety of improvements that could be made at the plant. Uh, what uh, what the biogas, the addition of the biogas would uh, could achieve for us um, and did that initial study, which came out favorable, had a decent return on investment. So the next step then was we did a, and that was completed in November of 2016. Uh, the next study we did was a market assessment that was done in September of 2017. And we identified a bunch of different fog sources in the area, including some of the colleges, restaurants. And uh, we actually had a um, Russell Reed who was located nearby in New Jersey. They collect a great deal of fog and they bring it to a, uh, a holding pit at their facility. Um, and they were probably the largest and most interested in bringing uh, fog to the Easton plant uh, just due to their location and their volume. So we then went on to do a study uh, and work on with uh, Manhattan College and, and with, with Hazen, I should say, uh, did all of these studies um, to see if there was any issues potentially at the, at the, the pilot scale, lab scale, for accepting um, the fog into our digesters. Would there be foaming? How much gas would be produced? Would there be more gas produced than currently? And uh, you know, what kind of quality would we be looking at? And that study was done in November of 2018. And then finally in, uh, in uh, this October of 2019, we finished the uh, uh, preliminary engineering study, uh, which kind of gave an idea of the scope of work for the project. Um, so next slide, please. So this is uh, just going over before I get ahead of myself. Um, this is going over the various uh, fog receiving facilities in the area. Uh, there was one nearby in New Jersey that actually is no longer taking fog. Uh, you can see the location of Russell Reed nearby. Uh, the Easton plant, and then uh, LCA and Delcora 
take fog, uh, we're not aware of anyone else nearby that takes a significant amount of fog, if, if any, um, at this point. So the EHASA is a uh, prime location for, for uh, fog receiving. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so when we completed the um, preliminary engineering uh, portion of the project, uh, the estimated cost for, and I have another slide at the end, but the estimated cost for the project uh, was approximately uh, $6 million. And so we worked with Hazen and we were looking at the different returns on investment and different things that could be changed to try and bring down the cost of the project and do some value engineering and come up with a, um, you know, basically a scope of work that, uh, that was affordable. Um, and at the time there was uh, Pennsylvania had alternative and clean energy grants available. So we applied for one of those grants uh, upon completion of the preliminary engineering. And in July of 2020, we actually uh, were awarded uh, close to $1.8 million uh, in an alternative and clean energy grant from the state with the help of some of our local uh, politicians. Uh, came through Senator Boscola's office. And so that made the project and the finances even more affordable. So in August of 2020, uh, we approved the design proposal from Hazen and we got started on uh, the project. So these are the main elements of the project. Uh, we're initially starting with the fog receiving station and I'll, I'll provide a little more detail on this uh, with some of the other slides. We're reusing an existing gravity belt thickener building, which used to be a dissolved air flotation thickening building, uh, and some of the tankage in there in that building space. Um, we're going to be upgrading uh, digester number three uh, and adding a mixing system to it to increase gas production. Uh, right now, digester one and digester two have vertical draft tube mixers in them. And digester number three is gonna have a pumped mixing system just due to the, the age and the type of floating cover we have there. Um, seems like um, our discussions with Hazen that that's the most practical approach at that point. Uh, there'll be some electrical improvements and the uh, combined heat and power units and biogas pretreatment will go on a new pad, the upper area of the plant. And then the piping from that uh, unit will be uh, uh, connected to the boiler building. And what'll happen is the hot water and um, from, from those units will actually provide hot water through our existing boilers and will supplement the use of uh, methane in those boilers at this point. Um, and they'll only really come on as needed, um, run far, far less than, than they do now. And there'll be some major electrical work because we'll be tying into the plant's uh, primary switch gear and um, uh, bringing electricity back and powering a portion of the plant. So as part of the fog receiving, we uh, looked at a bunch of different types of receiving. We actually, uh, right now in the specs, we, we uh, pilot tested the beast unit and uh, we're, we are going to specify that unit at this point uh, to do the pretreatment work um, needed when the fog's received and also to allow us to potentially receive food waste in the future, um, if possible, if we, if we need to or want to, depending on the amount of fog that's uh, available. And that will be located just outside our gravity belt thick, thickener building. All right, next slide. So after the fog goes, is pretreated and goes into the storage tanks, um, that'll be one element of the project. And then we'll have biogas that'll be coming from our digester gas piping system. It'll go into tanks and it'll be cleaned, um, remove uh, sulfides and siloxanes, and then it'll come out and it'll go to um, a compression moisture removal system, and from there it can get fed into the um, into the uh, engine generators. Next slide, please. 
This is a photo of the two engine generators on the right and an interior photo. Um, there we're looking at containerized uh, combined heat and power systems. And just to give you guys some, uh, some numbers just to throw out there. So right now, the plant's producing about 130,000 cubic feet of gas per day. It's estimated uh, that with the addition of fog, that the, um, the digesters will produce about 200,000 cubic feet of gas per day. Um, right now, we're looking at an estimate of about 40% uh, electricity generation for the plant. Um, it's kind of a tough projection because the plant uh, uh, energy or electrical use varies a little bit, but on average, it's about 400 to 420,000 kilowatts per month. And so we're looking to supplement about 40% of that. Uh, the plant's biggest use of electricity are the, um, we have six 150 horsepower dual speed mechanical aerators. And the, the interesting thing is that they use about half the electricity for the plant. So um, other than those, there's actually a belief and estimate that uh, the combined heat and power system could potentially power the entire remainder of the plant other than those uh, mechanical aerators once it's up and running in, in full force and we have enough fog. Um, we're initially gonna start with about 5,000 gallons per day, five day, days a week of fog delivery and acceptance. And then if that works well, uh, ramp up to a maximum of about 15,000 gallons a day, five days per week. That's about the limitation of our digester capacity at this point. So um, here's a schedule for the project. Um, our grant expires in, uh, in 2023. So we're really shooting, you know, to that's driving the schedule uh, to try and get this moving and done and constructed. So that's um, that's basically um, what's what's pushing the project. So and so here's just I'll just kind of go through this uh, quickly, but the estimated project cost is about six million dollars. We received the, the uh, grant from the state for about 1.7 million. And then if you go through, we have some heat and electrical savings, some revenue from the fog delivery. And then we have some additional costs for the uh, O&M and sludge hauling and disposal and a debt service uh, associated with the borrowing that we did for some other projects, including this project back in, uh, in earlier this month, actually. Uh, that that uh, borrowing was completed. So right now, this project is looking at about $130,000 a year savings. It, if we get up to 15,000 gallons per day of fog five days per week, and with with no issues, and we, um, we could actually get that savings, you know, a little over double, almost close to $300,000 per year uh, with this project. I think that's about it. Hopefully I didn't talk too long. Uh, that's, uh, that's all I have and happy to answer any questions. Well, that, that was, thanks, thanks Jeff and, and Chuck and Carrie and Alex. Um, that was amazing. Uh, you know, it, it's so interesting because the, most people who drive by the plant every day or who live in, in the, the service area, I'm sure they probably have no idea of all these things that are happening um, at the EHASA. And you basically are becoming a self-sustaining facility. I mean, it's amazing the different projects that you're doing. So um, what I'm going to do now is we're gonna open it up um, for questions. Questions have been coming in our Q&A um, as all of you have been giving your presentation. So I'm gonna start going through those questions now. The first one I think was sort of answered, but I'll, I'll ask it anyways. For each of these projects, what sort of cost savings are you estimating? Jeff, I think you did answer a lot of that. And where will these savings come from? So uh, a couple things that, uh, uh, you know, the on the bar screen project, you know, we'll certainly uh, hope to have less equipment maintenance work needed 
Uh, Chuck and Alex and Carrie have pictures of the primary clarifiers loaded with rags when they take them down for cleaning every summer. Uh, so there's certainly some maintenance there. Uh, I think on the disc filter project, either Alex or Carrie mentioned at the end that we uh, be able to reuse some of that cleaner water for chemical feed uh, and for seal water. And we're now using potable water for that. Right. Right now uh, we're getting water from um, the water plant. And now we'll be able to hopefully when this is up and running, use our effluent to take over potable water. So we're not paying that bill anymore. We'll be able to use what we're discharging um, as our seal water, as our chase water, utility water, those sorts of things. We spend about $60,000 a year uh, for potable water for the, uh, as Carrie mentioned, the seal water and some of the chemical feeds. And we're hoping to you know, reduce that maybe to 10 to 15,000 a year. Excellent. And as, Excellent. as I noted for the fog project, we'll have some heat and electrical savings and we'll have some savings or some tipping fees from the fog uh, acceptance. And that, that should uh, offset uh, the cost of the project. And the grant helped a lot with those finances. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, we're getting a little um, promotional things for all of you there at the EHASA. Um, I got a note here from, from Janet Surfaz. She thinks that um, the EHASA plant should be on the next Eastern Operator Tour, which I have to agree, it's an amazing operation there and you guys are doing some great things. So Janet, feel free to give them a call and see what you can arrange. Um, so should, we, should we talk about the last time we had the plant tour and we had like two feet of snow in March? Oh my gosh, our <laughs> landscaping looks so good and we did all this work and, and then snow. And it all got covered, we were, had the back That will out. happen again. Yeah, that's not gonna actually, happen. I, I think the city brought the front end loader in to clear the snow for the tent. It was uh, so maybe we'd take the uh, a summer or fall meeting. Yeah, we don't want the March one. <laughs> we don't want the March meeting. Why, why don't we wait for all of our projects to be finished so everybody can see how it looks when it's all said and done and we don't have to worry our, about construction. I think, I think that's a plan, but you guys definitely need the promotion for sure. So we had another question here. Has COVID affected any of these projects in any way? Lengthened your schedules, hired your costs, or made it unable to get certain materials? So, uh, yes, we, um, we were, the disc filter project was bid um, in January and that did not necessarily, I don't think, escalate the cost too terribly, but the disc filter equipment, I believe the lead time, uh, I don't know, I don't wanna say it doubled, but it, it's significantly longer than we originally um, expected. Um, the bar screen project is pretty straightforward. Uh, we're just doing some building modifications there, things like that, but we've actually added to our schedule for the contractors, we've added some time just because it takes a while to get anything uh, these days. Uh, we're fortunate that the disc filter building is a block building. As most people know, if it was stick frame, the price of lumber these days is ridiculous. So we we did not have to, to uh, have, we didn't have any, any issues with that. So we'll see once we get into the bar screen project, if the estimated equipment time for some of that stuff you know, how that looks compared to what we were told during the uh, design phase. Um, and the, and biogas right now, uh, we are in design. Um, I don't know that we've run into anything yet that we've talked to Micah about from Hazen, um, you know, if there, that there's anything on the, on the radar that might be longer than, than expected uh, for as uh, lead times go. So, um, uh, you know, to kind of piggyback on, on that question, you've, you have three major, kind of three with little side projects in, included in them, major projects going on at the same time. From a planning standpoint, when you guys all sat down and you decided, okay, we're going to do all these different things, how, how did you, it's, it's hard enough to plan one project, let alone three major projects. Do they all 
kind of hinge together. So if one isn't working out well from a timing standpoint, did that affect another one? How are you all handling that from a timing standpoint? We're very thankful that they're all divided throughout the plant. So they're not isolated to one location. So that makes it a lot easier for everybody to work at the same time. And they're staggered. So we are gonna have, be able to complete a few before an, uh, the fog project would even begin. Great. Great. Um, we have another question here. Um, this one comes from Tom Pular. Um, first of all, he says, excellent job. Um, are there any concerns about odors from the screening containers or screening buildings based on your new screening devices? So, uh, no, currently, uh, you know, we add lime to our screening bins. Uh, every four hours, we put a couple of lime in to keep the odors down. And, uh, we uh, take all our sludge to the landfill combined with the screenings. So uh, practice here is what we do is we line the bin, put the screenings in it, and then cover it with sludge. And then also, Chuck, your grid and screenings bins are actually inside a building? They are, Yes, they are inside the building. And and fall, as far as the fog project goes, definitely odors, was a, a, odors are a consideration. Um, we're reusing the existing tankage in the uh, gravity belt thickener building and some other tankage. So that corner of the plant, there's no residential units or housing or anything nearby us uh, when they're offloading, um, you know, into the beast unit, there should be relatively, the odor should be relatively minor. Uh, we actually even brought in the, the beast unit that we pilot tested, we brought in fog from Russell Reed, they provided us a truckload so we could pilot test the unit and we could see what it what it was like. It, you know, and outside was 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 actually just fine. Inside the building was, you know, you wouldn't want to be in there too long. But uh, <laughs> Hazen is taking um, taking steps to mitigate the odors from the potential fog receiving. Great, great, thank you. So we have another question here. Um, Alex had mentioned that storm events result in some of the washouts. Um, have these events been happening more often or more severely and in, in a way that they didn't in the past? And is this changing the way we need to design these plants moving forward? We've been lucky that most of those have been historical events and we haven't seen them in the last two years. But when we do get our sledge blankets and it gets hit with a heavy rain event, it's just a, the perfect storm, to be honest. And that's what we're trying to event, uh, prevent with the disc filter. But lately we've seen less than 10 milligrams per liter for our solids. So I'm hopefully we just keep trending that direction and the disc filter is just a extra uh, like Band-Aid to our problem. I, I would like to piggyback off that you know, we see a huge increase in the water that we get at the plant during really large rain events when we get a lot of water at the, at the same time because we are a combined system. So we are stormwater and residential. You have other plants that are designed just to take waste and not stormwater. So they won't see those big jumps that we do. Luckily enough, our plant is actually able to handle a significant amount of um, weather conditions about weather, rain, and stuff like that. Um, we don't see, as Alex said, we see have historical events where we'll have problems with the TSS, but that's not a consistent thing that we get here. I would just, just to, to add to that even further, we, um, it seems like, and we've studied this to death with many people over the last 20 years, but the, uh, in the fall and the spring, the shoulder months, we seem to get more issues with uh, just the biology that, and sometimes it, there could have been a storm event or some plant washout or some storm event before it, but that that just kind of happens. Um, and so I think even when we did the pilot testing and the design, some of our, our highest, um, you know, solids readings were not on wet weather days. Uh, which was, you know, really interesting. And the other thing I would say, just uh, what Carrie said, is that a lot of plants in 2017, 2018 had a, a lot of issues with all the heavy rain. We were actually, uh, I think our, our average flow may have gone up, um, you know, a, a fair amount, but we did not have near the overflow or SSO or 
treatment issues that a lot of other places had um, just because of the system being designed and our, our interceptors and pump stations being so large because of the combined portion of the system. And then treatment wise, and treatment wise, Sarja, um, yeah, you know, we, we've learned throughout the years, we've tried different ways to minimize uh, occurrences that we have. And, uh, you know, we had one last year, we were able to get it under control fast and prevent any permit violations. So we've, we've learned throughout the years, like what works and what doesn't work. Great. Was some of that related to filamentous growth, uh, Chuck and Alex? No, so uh, this last event, uh, we just lost our set abilities dropped to almost like 50 and we lost our biomass and we got some rain and it just got away from us. And, uh, you know, we bought some uh, engineered microorganisms, put them in the ditch, you know, and took all the steps, cutting the waste back and building our blanket back up and probably 48 hours we had it under control. Micah, you're thinking of our foaming issues that we recently had. That was definitely filamentous, but that didn't result in any increased TSS for us. Okay. Great. Yeah, the, the filaments were just kind of, I mean, a little unsightly, but it didn't treatment wise affect us. So I have I have a question um, for all of you folks. So with the new treatment, and, and Carrie, you kind of hit on it, and I think um, for any of the industries out there and maybe residents, you hit on this topic already, which is fantastic. With all the upgrades and the um, increase in efficiencies of the treatment, um, ultimately, over time, that will impact the operational costs of the plant, which ultimately impacts the, um, the end users, which would be for surcharges, things of that matter. Um, how about what how does it impact with the increase in the um, treatment and the efficiencies? Um, ultimately, how will that impact your MPDES permit with the state? And then um, potentially even your local limits that are um, impressed upon your, your industries. Let Jeff take that one. It's all you, Jeff. <laughs> so that's actually not keep a, that up for you. Yeah, so that it's it's not actually a simple answer so that the, the fog. I made it that way, Jeff Morgan. That's the way I made it. The fog in the bar screen project, you know, that they're kind of, that, that, that doesn't really impact the, uh, the permitting, but the disc filter project, since we're on a direct discharge to the Delaware river and we're in their special protection watershed, we had to be sure that that project would not trigger specific upgrades they have in their regulations that would require um, additional treatment. Um, and they agreed that the project was not in that category. So that was one of the first things we had to do. Um, and then after that, we spoke to DEP about, you know, maintaining our current limits and why we were doing this project. And it was, you know, as far as wet weather and avoiding upsets minimizing impacts from upsets and that they agreed uh, our permit has not been modified. We got a, a construction permit uh, from DEP, water quality management permit for the project and everything that's moving ahead in 2023 when we, we redo our permit application and submit it, get a new permit, we'll, we'll see what they have to say. But I mean, the disc filters aren't set up at this point to remove nutrients or anything like that. Um, just really solids at this point. So uh, we did have a lot of discussions with them about that as part of this, this project. Uh, and then from there, we'll see if there's a change when we redo our local limits again, uh, when we get our next new permit and see if there is some increases in removal efficiencies for, you know, from say metals or whatever from the influence of the effluent as compared to what we have now. So. So time will tell, right? Time will tell. Excellent, excellent. Well, we are getting um, close to our closing noon hour. Um, I don't have any more questions um, from the um, from the attendees. But what I would like to do at this point is I'm going to share my screen again and um, 
have up for everybody um, a little bit of a wrap up slide. Hopefully everybody can see that with a list of all of our panelists today. Again, um, a huge thank you to Alex Hoffman, Carrie Lambert, Chuck Wilson, um, and Jeff Morgan and Micah Blate from Hazen and Sawyer. Um, big shout out to Hazen and Sawyer again for being today's sponsor. We really do appreciate that. Um, we want to thank all of our attendees for joining today and hope that you gathered some very valuable information on some of the great things happening right here in the Lehigh Valley at the Eastern Area Joint Sewer Authority. Um, you know, it's it's amazing all of these projects, how they um, ultimately will impact um, overall environmental quality and um, our end users. So we're, we're thrilled that you guys are working so hard on these and having great success. And we look forward to that summer tour. Um, I already got something from Janet. She goes, she can line up a summer tour for you guys. <laughs> She'll ensure the weather, <laughs> sunshine galore. Um, but it, it, uh, we want to thank everyone here today. And um, I also want to thank our entire PIX board for helping put all of this together. And if anybody um, on the call today is interested in learning more about PIX, please make sure and visit our website at www.lvpix.org. We're always looking for new and creative ideas and members. Um, we'd love for you to join one of our meetings and um, get some ideas ideas from you to help better serve you um, and the industry. So make sure and fill out that survey and let us know a little bit more um, about what you're interested in hearing. But again, I want to thank the entire EAJSA team for joining us today. Micah, again, Hazen and Sawyer for being our sponsor and thank all of our attendees and which each and every one of you a wonderful weekend. Thanks for being here today, everybody. Happy thank Friday. Happy Friday. Ha <laughs> ha